good to be with you in God's house. Uh, before we do anything, let's say good morning to our radio friends, shall we? Ready? One, two, three. Good morning, radio. Good to have them with us as well. We're gathering in God's house on the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. And basically, our, our, the theme for our worship this morning revolves around uh, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto, do unto you. Love your neighbor uh, is basically what we're being reminded of this morning. And, and doesn't that come down to understanding those two very important words? What does it mean to love? And then, who is my neighbor? And uh, hopefully we'll be reminded of that this morning to say this, this love that we show to one another. Who is my neighbor? That's what we're going to do. So everything for our worship this morning is in your service folder up on the screen. Is that up and running there, Miss Katrina? All right, up on the screen. So let's get started. You'll need to have that, uh, that folder, service folder, or the screen to, to participate and follow along. So top of page three of that service folder. We begin our worship service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We worship our triune God for the salvation he gives us. Amen. Would you grab a hymnal? Let's sing our first hymn today, hymn 259. stand. Dear friends, let us humbly and honestly approach God to confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Gracious Lord, I confess that I am naturally born to be dead in my sin. I am altogether helpless for reaching eternal life in heaven. I am guilty of faithless worrying and selfish pride for pet sins that I do over and over and so many other sins I don't even realize I do. Because of the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should drive me away from your presence forever by sending me to hell. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins and I plead for your mercy. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ through faith, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear and trust the promise of forgiveness, which is ours through faith 
As Jesus said to the paralyzed man and his friends in Luke chapter 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. We are thankful for and trust in God's merciful promises. Dear Lord, please strengthen and guide us so that we live our lives to your glory. Amen. In the security of his promises, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord have For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ have For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return, Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us, that we may live for you. Dear, Dear Lord, Lord, strengthen our faith so that we do this. Amen. with me and let's pray together our prayer of the day today. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for planting the seed of your word in our hearts through your gift of faith. We ask that you help us to joyfully receive your gospel so that we constantly produce more and more fruits of that faith by loving you and those around us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first scripture lesson today comes from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, that Moses was commanded by God to repeat the laws that were originally given by God through Moses to the Israelites at Mount Sinai. Um, I'm a firm believer in the phrase repetition is the mother of learning and a good reminder for us to keep reviewing what we learned in confirmation, keep reviewing what those commandments, what those chief parts are. And this is what Moses is doing with the Israelites when he's repeating them in that book of Deuteronomy. <clears throat> and we have to be careful. God promises to us, even today, especially today, promises to bless us when we are faithful to him. Bless us both physically and spiritually. And some people can take that the wrong way, to say, ah, I'm going to be faithful to God so that he blesses me and gives me more stuff. That's not why we obey, right? That's not why we listen and follow what God says. We listen and follow simply because he says so, and if and when he chooses to bless me, then I'll say thank you. It's not the reason why we obey is to be blessed. But God says, I promise to bless you to the Israelites and to us as well. And, and, and also there's a good reminder, the last couple of verses in this section. You know, God's law, the direction that he gives us in our lives, too many people look at it as a ball and chain. I got too many rules, too many commands to follow and makes life boring. Well. Those laws are given for a blessing to, be, to give us order, to give us stability, to put order in society. And, 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 and God reminds, God reminds the Israelites and reminds us of that too. Of, it's not a burden. It's not a burden to follow God's law and be faithful to him. Deuteronomy chapter 30 beginning at verse 6. 
The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your hearts and with all your soul and live. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies who hate and persecute you. You will again obey the Lord and follow all his commands I am giving you today. Then the Lord your God will make you most prosperous in all the work of your hands and in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock and the crops of your land. The Lord will again delight in you and make you prosperous, just as he delighted in your fathers, if you obey the Lord your God and keep his commands and, <clears throat> and decrees that are written in this book of the law, and turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea, so that you have to ask, Who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so you may obey it. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commands, decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. That's the end of our first scripture lesson. Let's read responsibly our verses of the day, reading from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 22. Alleluia, alleluia. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. second scripture lesson comes from the New Testament, the epistle, the letter that St. Paul wrote to the Christians in the Greek city of Colossae, and reminding them, thanking them, thanking them for their Christian living. That makes me think, isn't it true that people notice, people notice how we live, either positively or negatively, and word gets around, reputation, if I have a good reputation or not so good reputation, how I live, how I serve, how I show love to the people around me. And Paul is saying, Paul is, is, is not here. Of course, he's writing this letter to them because he is not there to tell them to their face. But he's saying, boy, thank you, you Christians in Colossae, for, for loving your neighbor as yourself and showing that Christian love to the people around you. Sometimes that's a huge, huge building bridge, right? Building bridges, building relationships with people by showing love and kindness and service to people I don't even know. Showing love to our neighbor. Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God 
being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has re rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's the end of our second scripture lesson this morning. Would you grab a hymnal? Let's sing our second hymn today, hymn 494. qualified to make the following statement since I would say I have lived in both situations. The statement is this, there are pros and cons to living in a small town. Now there could be a debate to say whether a town like Norfolk is a small town or not. I would say not. It's got a lot of stoplights to me that says Norfolk is not a small town. But I've never lived in a big city. I've never lived in a Phoenix or an Omaha or a Minneapolis or a Chicago, a big city, you know, a metro area like that. Never lived there. But I have lived in towns like Norfolk, Nebraska, Hastings, Nebraska. Those are the towns, the biggest towns I have lived in. But I have lived in smaller towns, Juneau, Wisconsin, Marcusan, Wisconsin, towns that hover right around the 1,000 population mark. And again, <clears throat> I get there are bigger towns and I get that there are smaller towns, but personally, I have experienced what I'd say is both a bigger town and a smaller town. There are pros and cons to living in a small town. We've done that. I'm going to start with the cons. The cons of living in a small town, or the con is that everybody knows everything. That there is that fishbowl effect, that nothing is hidden, that my neighbors, the town, seem to know what I'm going to grill before I even get something out of the freezer. 
that they know if and when I'm going to buy a car. They know if and when and where, how long I'm going to be on vacation. It's not just a pastor thing, but it's a community thing. Everybody knows everything. And that's a field that is ripe for gossip, that is ripe for rumors, that too often everybody knows everything. They think they know everything, but they don't. The pros... A pro for living in a small town is the exact same thing. Everybody knows everything. And in a good way. What a nice thing to have your neighbors, to have the people in town knowing what's going on, both the happy things and the not-so-happy things. That if I need some help, isn't it nice in that small town that everybody knows everything and say, well, yeah, take my pickup. Yeah, yeah, do this. Go into the garage and grab the tools that you need. Just put them back. Everybody knows everything. <clears throat> My experience is, and I'm not saying anything against Norfolk, we've got wonderful, wonderful neighbors in our, our neighborhood yonder, but it tends to be, in this bigger city, bigger cities, people can get swallowed up. People can forget about that reality and blessing of neighbors. Who is my neighbor? How is it that I react to, to, to the people around me? Or do I just react to the people who are in my immediate vicinity? In our text, Jesus reminds us, gives us a teaching lesson. Just what does it mean to love? Just exactly who is it that my neighbor neighbors are? And so we have the command, we have the reminder for us this morning to be a good neighbor. Part of what this lesson is that Jesus teaches us is that we're reminded being a good neighbor also means to take full responsibility from the law. And when I do that, When I understand how that law affects me and how that law guides my life, doesn't that also guide how I show love to my neighbor? I pattern my love after the love that was shown to me. So, be a good neighbor. Would you follow along? Reading from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. That's our text. We know nothing about this man who came to Jesus and confronted him. We get a pretty clear picture that this man was not on a friendly visit to have a friendly conversation with Jesus. He came there to test him. But this man was an expert in the law, that there was this faction in the Jewish religion that put way, way, way more importance on the Old Testament law than needed to be. They, quite honestly, didn't understand very well what the purpose of those Old Testament laws were. That's certainly some of the laws that God gave at Mount Sinai were civil laws that give stability and order to society. What a blessing laws and commands can be even for us today, right? But a lot of those ceremonial laws 
were different. They had a different purpose than those civil laws, the ceremonial laws, the laws that guided the worship life of the Jews. They pointed ahead to the Savior that would come into the, in the future. And there was an awful lot of Jews who lost sight of this and looked at those ceremonial laws, the worship laws, as simply more of these laws that God gave for, for all the people just to do. Because that's what God does. He gives commands and, and he likes us, his children, his children of Israel, us to follow his laws because God is God and we follow, we obey what he says. There's a point. There's a point to that. That's true. But those ceremonial laws, again, were worship laws. These were laws that God gave to the Israelites saying, don't forget, don't forget that I will send you a Savior sometime in the future. And this expert in the law was one of many, many Jews that turned those ceremonial laws in, into work righteousness. Instead of following these laws out of thanks and praise to God for what he will do, would do in the future, they say, ah, this is another opportunity for me to impress God. If I obey these laws and even add some laws to that boy, I'll impress God and he'll take me home to heaven. We very clearly see that attitude. He wanted to justify himself. We see him coming to test Jesus. He was not on Jesus' side, so to speak. Because remember, Jesus was on his way from Galilee, Capernaum in the north, down to the southern part of, of Israel, to Jerusalem. A couple of weeks ago, we had in our gospel lesson, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem that he was going. He knew exactly when he was going to suffer and die on the cross. And so he was making his way with his disciples from the north to the south. And in this process of this trip, he was doing some teaching, teaching his disciples, making use of all the opportunities that he had to teach, including this expert of the law. Rabbi, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Look at that simple question, and doesn't that bring, raise questions in our, our minds as we understand and analyze that question. What must I do to inherit? To me, there's an obvious oxymoron contradiction right there. What must I do to inherit? Even leaving God out of that equation, right? What does, what does a person do to inherit anything? Nothing. An inheritance is something that somebody gives to somebody else. An inheritance. So this man already had this work righteous attitude for confronting Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answers his question with a question, putting him on the spot. Because this man certainly seems like he was trying to trip Jesus up. He was trying to have Jesus make a mistake so the Jews would have an excuse to get rid of him. What do you say? What does the law say? How do you read? How do you interpret the law. And the guy answers very, very honestly, very truthfully, very accurately. Doesn't he summarize the two tables of the Ten Commandments, right? You can divide those Ten Commandments into two tables, two groups. One through three guides our relationship with God. Four through ten guides our relationship with one another. Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Isn't that true? That if we love God more than anything else, if we love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves, if we sin live sinless, perfect, holy, selfless lives, we can go to heaven. I can be responsible for my salvation. That's what the expert in the law thought. I'm a pretty good guy. I know all these laws. I'm doing pretty well. I treat others nicely. He thought he could be responsible for his eternal salvation. But as we're going to read through our confession of faith in a few minutes, aren't we reminded that the responsibility for eternal salvation is entirely resting on our triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all working together for the salvation of our souls. I've got nothing to do with that. But the expert of the law concerning responsibility anyway, was right on. To say responsibility for eternal life, we tend to, 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 to go on the side, eternal life only means I'm going to heaven. But dear friends, everybody is going to have eternal life. 
Thankfully, through faith, we have eternal life in heaven. But those who have no faith also live eternally, but in the fire of hell. And so when you talk about and remember and realize what Jesus is saying, when anybody spends that eternity in hell, the responsibility for that eternal damnation is on the individual, is on the person who doesn't trust and believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And then on the flip side, thankfully, don't we humbly thank and praise our God to say thank you, triune God, Jesus, for doing everything so that I don't go to hell, so that I do have eternal salvation. And showing love to our neighbors is more, much more than just physically helping them, him, her, when he or she needs some help, but looking, keeping our eyes open for the opportunity to share this responsibility, this responsibility and truth of the law, but then also the responsibility and truth of the gospel. All praise goes to our triune God. And we again see the narrow-mindedness of this, this expert in the law. When Jesus is, is talking about, yeah, love your neighbor as yourself, golden rule. And the expert of the, in, in the law really shows how little he knows of, of God's law, how little or nothing he knows of the gospel. Because he asks, well, who is my neighbor? It's kind of like when Peter in, in Matthew 18 asks Jesus, Jesus, how many times should I, I forgive my, my, somebody who sins against me? Should I forgive him seven times? Boy, that's a lot of times to forgive somebody, Jesus. And Jesus said to Peter, not seven times, but 77. You keep on forgiving. As long as there is a repentance and forgiveness being asked, we keep on forgiving. And this is that same thing. Who is my neighbor? Isn't it easy to have a very narrow-minded definition of who my neighbor is? Well, my neighbor is, is Howard. He lives across on, on the other side of the property line. My neighbor is a person, people that live on the same block, same city. But dear friends... Loving our neighbors as ourselves really includes anybody, even those people who aren't so pretty, even those people who I may not like so much. Who is my neighbor? So here Jesus gives us, teaches that man through a parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan, very familiar to us. You have to understand a little bit, there's an added punch to this parable when you understand just who it is that those Samaritans are. Right? You, you realize that? I don't mean to turn my back on you, but I've done this before. But, but painting a, a, a mental geographic map for you, the Samaritans, that over here on the west there is the Mediterranean Sea, okay? And this is where the nation of Israel is. The Sea of Galilee is there. The Jordan River comes down. There's the Dead Sea. Up here is Galilee. That's where Capernaum is. That's where Jesus did most of his ministry. That's from where he left out resolutely to head Jerusalem. Jesus was up here, Samaria was in the middle, and Judah, Jerusalem, down in the south. So to get from Capernaum, Galilee, down to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through Samaria. Now why is it called Samaria? What's the significance of Samaria? The Samaritans. Samaritans were part Jew, part Gentile. That this goes back to the Babylonians and the Assyrians and all the different conquering. That Long story short, some Jews had mixed blood in them, the Samaritans. And the blue-blooded Jews, like a legal expert in the law, didn't like the Samaritans. That's the understatement of the day. It's kind of like the, the Jews and the Palestinians over there right now. They hate each other. And so here's Jesus' lesson. A guy is traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. He gets beat up, robbed, left for dead, thrown in the ditch. Who's the first guy that comes along? A priest. Boy, somebody's going to stop. You'd think a religious priest is going to stop and help the guy, right? What does he do? Oh, he even sidesteps him. He goes way out of the way. I've got better things to do. Goes right on by. A Levite is the second guy. A Levite? Priests were up here. Levites were there. But a Levite still, ooh, servant in the temple, right? If anybody's going to stop by, it's going to be a Levite, a religious guy. But again, he went right on by. And now, the third guy, who is it that stops? The supposed second-class citizen, the second-class kind of a Jew, the Samaritan, this guy who lives on the other side of the tracks, that kind of a person. He was the guy who stopped and showed mercy. 
And this is the reminder for me, for us, when my eyes, our eyes are open to do ministry, to share faith, that way too often I prejudge, I, I look at somebody and say, oh boy, that person isn't qualified. Oh, that person just doesn't look right. Maybe somebody walks into church that isn't quite wearing the right clothes. Say, oh boy. We prejudge and say, who is my neighbor? And say, why isn't a person like that my neighbor? Why isn't that Samaritan my neighbor? Is it because of my sinful selfishness, my arrogance, that I don't want to look for opportunities to share the gospel? That we look at all the opportunities, whether it's connected directly with church, whether it's at work, whether it's at play, whatever we're doing, to look for it and, and not make these prejudgments to say, who is my neighbor? And then, how do I treat that neighbor? Do I treat them kindly? Do I treat them with respect, with Christian love? Keeping in mind, again, the opportunity, the opportunity to share the good news of the gospel. Maybe that person already knows it. Thank God, praise God for that. But maybe that person does not. And so we look for those opportunities to love my neighbor as myself. Because sometimes even that golden rule can be abused, right? I'll love my neighbor as myself so I can get something out of it. I'll love you and help you today so maybe tomorrow when I need help, then you can help me tomorrow. Is that the motivation of Christian selfless love? Not at all. It's kind of like what we were talking about at Deuteronomy. That God promises to bless us spiritually and physically, but that's not the motivation. That's not the attitude that the Christian has in showing selfless love to the people around him or her. Because we think of Jesus. What did Jesus do? What, did, what was Jesus expecting to get out of loving us and serving us the way he did? What could you and I do for Jesus that he doesn't, didn't already have? Nothing, nothing but selfless, serving love that our Savior Jesus gave to us. And therefore, that is the motivation. That's the example we show to the people around us. Now, I'm not picking on an insurance company. This is true for any insurance company. But when I came, have this, this theme of our, our meditation in our text, be a good neighbor, makes me think of a jingle connected with an insurance company. They don't use it anymore, I don't believe. But like a good neighbor, blank is there. I don't mean to pick on this insurance company, because again, it's absolutely the same for any insurance company. Think about it. Is that really true? Like a good neighbor, blank is there. Any insurance company. Well, that insurance company will be there on some conditions, right? That insurance company will be there if you're paying your premium. It'll be there if you cover your deductible. It'll be there if you take care of all kinds of conditions. Is that the kind of neighbor that Jesus is talking about? No, it is not. To be a good neighbor, to be selfless, to serve, to love one another in Christian love, to serve our gracious God. And so, dear friends, there is that reminder to be a good neighbor, to be a good neighbor in our families, a good neighbor in our neighborhoods, good neighbor at work, wherever we are, to be a good neighbor, taking full responsibility connected with the law, then also showing love to the people around us based on the love that was shown to me. Amen. Would you please stand? And now may the grace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, guard and keep us in the one true faith until we reach eternal life in heaven. Amen. Would you join with me and let's confess our Christian faith. It's printed on page 8 of your service folder. Let's confess together. I believe the Bible teaches us that there is one God, yet that one God is also three distinct persons, who all work together for the salvation of my soul. I believe in God the Father Almighty, who made the universe and all it contains, and sustains it with his mighty power. He gave me my life so that I may learn about my Savior Jesus and be saved for eternity. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his one and only Son, who reconciled lost mankind to the Father through his perfect life, sacrificial death, and glorious resurrection. I believe in God the Holy Spirit, who gathers and strengthens sinners into God's forgiven family, which we call the Church. He creates saving faith in a person's heart through the faithful use of the gospel in word and sacraments. Even though I do not understand how three persons are still one God, through faith I believe this gracious truth, and I thank and praise this gracious triune God. Please be seated. Let's gather our thank offerings. Would you please stand for our prayers this morning? Keeping a Christian brother in our prayers, Dick Kester, uh, is going through the, the final stages of, of some cancer and, humanly speaking, looks to, to be going home to heaven. You know, you know, you know that as well as I do. Who, who knows? But uh, uh, keeping Dick, Dick and his friends and family in our prayers this morning. Let's pray. Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we humbly yet confidently approach you with our thanks, our praise, and our requests. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, for blessing us with all the things we need to live here on this earth and so much more which you give to us through our wonderful country. Dear Jesus, the Son, we thank you for coming to be our substitute, suffering sin's punishment so that we don't have to. And God, the Holy Spirit, we thank you for using the power of word and sacrament to create and strengthen our saving faith. Be with all those about to receive your Holy Supper. Give us humble faith to trust that through this miraculous meal, we receive your grace through Jesus' body and blood, which is also bread and wine. We ask that you continue to bless us in the future as you have done in the past. Bless us as a spiritual family of believers as we're gathered here this morning to grow in grace. Motivate us all to love each other in the same way you have loved us. This morning we join as brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for all those undergoing medical trials. Please be with Dick Kester as he endures the final stages of his cancer. Give him and his family and friends the only lasting peace and comfort that comes through the message of your grace. Be with each of us during this coming week and protect us in all we do. 
Guide us with your word so that all we do is done to the glory of your holy name. We ask these things, dear God, because Jesus has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <clears throat> thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm on the bottom of page 9, moving on into our communion liturgy, preparing our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper. What is the sacrament of Holy Communion? It is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, together with the bread and wine, instituted by Christ for us Christians to eat and to drink. What blessings do we receive through this eating and drinking? That is shown us by these words, given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Through these words we receive forgiveness of sins life and salvation in this sacrament. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. How can eating and drinking do such great things? It is certainly not the eating and drinking that does such things, but the words given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. These words are the main thing in this sacrament along with the eating and drinking. And whoever believes these words has what they plainly say, the forgiveness of sins. Who then is properly prepared to receive this sacrament? Fasting and other outward preparations may serve a good purpose, but he is properly prepared who believes these words, given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. But whoever does not believe these words or doubts them is not prepared because the words for you require nothing but hearts that believe. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Then Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. May the peace of the Lord's grace and mercy always be with us. and encourage all those confirmed members of our congregation here at St. Paul's or of our sister congregations of the Wisconsin Synod. Follow the direction of the ushers and receive God's grace through Jesus' body and blood.
Would you please stand as we conclude our service this morning? Top of page 12, the Latin word says nunc, the nunc dimittis. These are the Latin for let, let us now depart. Uh, again, again, this goes, goes to Simeon, right? When, when Jesus was eight days old and Joseph and Mary brought him to the temple to be circumcised to fulfill the law, there was Simeon, an old, old guy, saying, ah, oh, now that I've seen this salvation, now I'm ready to go. Now I'm ready to depart. Let us now depart in peace. The nunc dimittis, page 12. the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. And let's join in our closing prayer. Turn the page, top of page 13. Again, let's join together. We pray. Gracious Father, you have commanded me to worship only you. I know that in this week ahead, I will be tempted to worship the things or perhaps the people of this world. Through the power of your gospel, which I have used today and will use this week, strengthen my faith so that I resist all evil temptations and give glory to you by all that I say and do. I commit myself to your care confident that you will use this week to your glory and my good. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Let's sing our closing hymn this morning, hymn 470. <laughs>